Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. My name is Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. The year gone by has proven to be an inflection point for digital India. From big tech to the government, India's digitization drive has received or is poised to receive a fillip in both innovation and regulation. 5G rolled out a red carpet of promises. And despite crypto's epic fail, Web 3.0 has emerged as the watchword in tech innovation, with both startups and big techs flocking to the metaverse. How big was the year 2022 then for tech in India and what new frontiers can 2023 conquer? Devargya Sanyal examines the source code in the following report. We are creating three horizontals. The Telecom Bill for the Carrier, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill focused on enforcing citizens' privacy and the Digital India Bill which looks at practically everything else required to be regulated, Union IT Minister Ashwini Vaishnav recently said. 2022 was the year of the regulator for the tech industry in India and across the world. India's IT Minister Ashwini Vaishnav's statement sums up how serious the Indian government is towards introducing a regulatory overhaul expected to be completed in the next 14 to 16 months. It was also a year that saw major layoffs among big techs in wake of the recession scare in the Western nations. And world governments doubled down on them to put in place robust systems of checks and balances in terms of data privacy, competitive market and regulating online transactions. Add to this the FTX and crypto crash and the year 2022 does seem humbling for the technology sector. The early signs of trouble for big techs came from Europe. When the European Union approved the Digital Services Act on April 22nd, the act holds social media companies more accountable for the content they host. The law bans ads targeted at minors or at a user's gender or ethnicity and those that use deceptive practices. It also includes provisions designed to force platforms to crack down on content like hate speech and commercial scams with fines that could reach billions of dollars for large firms. Things took a dramatic turn when Alphabet-owned Google, already under scrutiny by EU antitrust regulators since August, was fined twice by the Competition Commission of India within a week for abusing its market dominance in the Android devices ecosystem and Play Store policies. The fines came to a total of around 2,273 crore rupees. While periodic regulatory scrutiny, antitrust and privacy-related lawsuits against tech giants like Google, Meta and Apple are becoming increasingly frequent. The year 2022 saw an unprecedented push from the Indian government to put in place a comprehensive regulatory framework for IT and telecom. The Telecom Bill and the Digital India Act replace a bunch of old laws and the Digital Personal Data Protection or DPDP Bill will enforce the right to privacy. The drafts of the Telecom Bill have been released for consultation, while the draft of Digital India Act is likely to come by December end. Speaking about the DPDP Bill, Kulbir Kaur, partner Forensics and Integrity Services at EY India, says the bill may have removed one of the biggest blocks in the Digital India story. She believes the revamp bill is much simpler and easier to comprehend. As soon as the General Data Protection Bill got instituted in EU, there was already a push on other nations and other countries to have something which is of an adequate nature. So it became imperative for us to have a dedicated Digital Data Protection Bill to stay relevant in the lines of the other economies like the US and the UK. To the Digital Data Protection Bill, that has come up uh, right at the end, fag end of 2020. This revised version is simpler, easier to comprehend, easier for a layman to understand what the requirements of a digital nagrik are, and more so what are the rights that the digital nagrik has in today's world. More recently, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Finance recommended India needs to enact a new Digital Competition Act 
and prescribe a code of conduct for tech giants so that they do not stifle competition with their market power. It listed a set of undesirable practices observed in the digital economy and said that a code of conduct based or ex ante approach was needed for digital market winners called digital market gatekeepers. But why did regulatory intervention become the theme in 2022? Salman Waris, managing partner at Tech Legis Advocates and Solicitors, explains. I think there are multiple factors. One, of course, is uh, you know India is very quickly maturing as a tech market. You know uh, the regulators have uh, started uh, uh, looking at things more with a fine tooth comb and uh, more uh, from a educated and informed uh, uh, opinion. Uh, they were uh, uh, you know long overdue. There is also certain political considerations as well. Uh, we are somewhere in the middle, almost heading into the next elections, and I think uh, the government wants to tighten the screws so that uh, you know the the next elections, uh, the big tech, um, are able to uh, be regulated by them and play a more informed role. Business standards, as Pranjal Sharma points, to the larger global forces that have caused the regulatory fist to close down in the big techs. I think the government, civil society, consumers, regulators across the world are very concerned about the business models which are being created. Are they anti-competitive? Second is how transparent is your model? How accountable are you to the consumers? I think these are the issues which apply to all other businesses are now coming strongly on technology-based big tech companies to ensure that they have to follow the same rules. They are not above regulation. They are not above questioning. They are not above accountability. And therefore, I think when innovation is discussed, they will have to think of innovations which ensure that accountability and uh, transparency is built into the technological solutions that they provide for consumers. However, even as regulators move to rein in the big techs, the year also saw crucial movements in tech innovations. Both Meta and Google ended the year with a focus on refining and adapting their artificial intelligence services to vernacular markets in India and other parts of the world. An increasing number of startups is entering the metaverse, while both Indian and global artists and content creators are flocking to the NFT marketplaces. Closer home, the government introduced the Open Network for Digital Commerce or ONDC and the Digital Rupee. Another major development on the financial front came from the growth of the account aggregator network launched in 2021. But the most talked about development came from the telecom sector. The ultra-high-speed fifth generation of 5G telecom services were launched in October. As of November 26, telecom operators have started 5G services in 50 towns in over 14 states and union territories of India. 5G telecom networks are expected to generate revenues of nearly $180 billion in the country by 2030, accounting for almost 2% of India's GDP, according to a report by industry body NASCOM and Arthur D. Little, a consultancy firm. The Indian smartphone market has seen a steady rise in the last five years, barring the COVID hit 2020, to grow 1.5 times from 2016 to 2021. The market is projected to grow 10% in 2023 to reach 175 million units. With the power of 5G in tow, 2023 is being projected as the year of further innovations in the IT and telecom sectors. With greater penetration of smartphones and young users rapidly entering the digital mainstream, how will the regulatory intervention affect the tech sector in the upcoming year? Sharma has this to say. So younger and younger students are coming digitally online. I think that's very exciting because you're going to have a far more inclusive society. The digital divide will reduce significantly as you ensure that more and more people are connected. But it also raises the anxiety, which is that for a lot of these people, issues of safety, privacy, etc. are not top of mind. Therefore, it's very, very important that regulators, governments and the technology service providers remain cognizant about the fact that the levels of privacy protection, data protection, anti-competitive behavior, the questions around them have to be far more rigorous than they were. So there is going to be a period where people will have access, but 
people may not have that kind of understanding. And I expect that regulators should be and would be very, very strict about protecting the rights of the new category of users who are joining the digital mainstream. The fifth gen mobile network is poised to catapult India Inc. in an era of fast connectivity in 2023. While more immersive services across the board will reach consumers, the year will also test the big tech and regulators' mutual intent in making the digital space safer and fairer for all users. World Cup in Qatar is over and Messi's Argentina has taken home the trophy. But the questions about the fate of migrant workers still linger. The World Cup and the attendant media coverage focused on the deplorable conditions migrant workers find themselves in, especially in countries in the Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC. It also begs the question, why are more and more Indians flocking to GCC countries despite reports of human rights violations? Tariq Ahmed and Devargya Sanyal look at the finer points in the following report. According to a 2020 Ministry of External Affairs report, 3.4 million Indians reside in the UAE and 2.5 million in Saudi Arabia. Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar together host around another 2.5 million Indians. That takes the total number of Indians residing in GCC countries to more than 8 million. A large number of these 8 million Indians are part of a steady stream of migrant workers helping build the region's cities and infrastructure, like the six new stadiums built in Qatar for the FIFA World Cup. While Qatar has been under the media lens recently, with reports of workers denied access to basic amenities like healthcare, etc., and of their deaths under harsh working conditions. The problem of human rights violations for migrant laborers has been prevalent across Gulf nations. In Gulf countries, the kafala or sponsorship system defines the relationship between foreign workers and their local sponsor or kafil, usually their employer. It has been used in GCC countries, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Jordan and Lebanon. Both Bahrain and Qatar claim to have abolished the system, though critiques say reforms are poorly enforced and often not implemented. Under this system, the state gives local individuals or companies sponsorship permits to employ foreign labourers. The sponsor covers travel expenses and provides housing. Rather than hiring an individual directly, sponsors sometimes use private recruitment agencies in the countries of origin to find workers and facilitate their entry to the host country. So in the example of recruitment, if companies simply started to vet their recruitment agents and use a recruitment agent that is trusted and conduct proper due diligence uh, with the recruitment agent and make sure that they ask any immigrant once they arrive in the country, so in this case, Qatar, once they arrive in Qatar, what was your recruitment experience like? Did you pay a recruitment fee? How much did you pay? Uh, were you given a receipt? And we will reimburse you. So technically, the fees should fall on the employer, not on the worker. So this is one example of many where uh, the reform process hasn't really translated to practice. However, there are times when workers are made to sign contracts they often do not understand. These contracts include conditions different from what they were promised. Workers then find themselves subjected to long work hours and poor working and living conditions. Their passports may get confiscated and their wages withheld. Such conditions contribute to expanding demand for trafficked migrants. This, in turn, creates even more lucrative opportunities for recruiters, exploiters and middlemen. 
these workers inevitably fall into a situation of debt bondage. They find themselves compelled to accept onerous terms and conditions. This is particularly common among construction, domestic and lower level service workers. The issues have been extensively documented in world media. Why then are an increasing number of migrant laborers from India still heading to these GCC countries in search of employment? Migrant workers contribute to their home country by sending back money or remittances to their respective families. India is the world's biggest recipient of these remittances, with inflows of nearly $100 billion expected in 2022. Half of this is sent by Indian workers in GCC countries. The main driver of this migration is the hope of a better future. Many Indians have been successful in achieving their Gulf dreams. Take the example of M.A. Yusuf Ali, the chairman of Lulu Group International, a multinational conglomerate company that operates a chain of hypermarkets and retail companies. Or take Azad Mupen, the director of Esther DM Healthcare. So are the conditions of migrant workers improving? In the early period, uh, say in the early 80s, certain countries uh, record in terms of uh, taking care of the welfare of the people uh, was not satisfactory. But I have noticed that there has been a continuous effort at improving this situation. For example, uh, most countries now have full-fledged labor ministries. They have uh, initiated new rules and norms relating to the treatment of workers. Many of the issues pertaining to workers are resolved by the ministry itself. And very rarely do we need to go to the labor courts. But the record of labor courts, in terms of their sympathy for the labor, uh, for the people employed, has also been satisfactory. Experts point to two aspects of the India GCC migration story. While it is necessary to guarantee strong labour laws and working conditions for migrant workers in GCC countries, it is equally important to ensure that sending people abroad is conducive to their welfare. A robust immigration clearance system can achieve this. Such a system can ensure that the promised work is legitimate and payments for their work will also be secure. Indian workers, the Immigration Act of 1983 was passed and it required Indians traveling to some countries for work to get an immigration clearance. Passports which carried the immigration check not required or ECNR stamp weren't required to seek such a clearance. Since 2007, only those passport holders that carry an immigration check required need to get such a clearance. All other passports are deemed to be ECNR passports. From the worries of migrant workers, let us move on to the worries of market watchers. It has been a choppy fortnight for the markets amid a resurgence of COVID-related fears. How do technical charters see markets play out in 2023? Which sectors and stocks hold promise in the year ahead? Business Standards, Puneet Wadwa, caught up with Gaurad Ratnaparki, Head of Technical Research at Sher Khan by BNP Paribas on the key levels he's tracking for the frontline indices and the stocks that are a must-have in your portfolio. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Puneet Vadhwa and we have Gaurav Ratnaparki, Head of Technical Research at Sher Khan by BNP Paribas today with us. Hello Gaurav and welcome. Hello Puneet. Uh, let me start by asking you for, you know, regarding the uh, outlook for the markets in 23. Uh, do you think that the Sensex will hit 57,000 levels again before it hits uh, the 75,000 mark? So uh, before going to 2023, I think it is important to understand from where the markets are coming in last one, one and a half years. So uh, the Nifty and the Sensex had entered a correction mode in October 2021. 
and after that uh, they had a correction uh, which was a multi month correction that developed in a, a slightly uh, downward sloping channel and in the month of uh, june 2022 uh, the market bottomed out and actually breakout from the channel happened in october 2022 so october november we had this rally and after this uh, in the month of december we are consolidating the gains so that shows uh, that we have uh, con convincingly broken out from the multi month uh, downward sloping channel so that means uh, sensex going back to the lower levels is unlikely and in fact i am expecting the sensex trajectory to remain positive for the next year that is for 2023 and for 2023 uh, my sensex target is around 68000 and the reversal for this bullish stance will be around 58000 whereas for nifty the target comes to around 20300 both these are the channel equality targets and uh, for that nifty should hold on to the level of 17500 so uh, you mentioned about the recent correction uh, at the at the index level so which also saw the psu banks uh, you know drop quite sharply does any stock appear oversold on the chart and what's a broad uh, broad view on the nifty bank index because banking is one of the most crowded trades uh, for 2023 according to most analysts yeah that's right especially the nifty psu bank index has seen a marvelous rally in last few months and after that it has seen this short term correction but this is just a pause this is just a pit stop in the overall rally and uh, this should be used as a buying opportunity not too many stocks have actually gone down to the oversold zone as such but uh, still they are posing this correction as a buying opportunity so uh, from the smaller uh, psu banking space uh, my picks will be uh, union bank and central bank for central bank uh, the correction which has brought it down towards 2830 is actually a buying opportunity uh, the stock can very well resume its larger uptrend and retest its high, which were around 41.80-42. Whereas for Union Bank, uh, any dip towards 75 will be a good buying opportunity, keeping a stop loss below 65. The first target on the higher side will be 95, with potential to head towards 120 in the medium term. And from the larger PSU banking space, uh, my pick is SBI. And as far as uh, the bank Nifty is concerned, Bank Nifty actually uh, has been leading the market on the way up and it uh, entered into the uncharted territory much ahead of Nifty. So the next uh, up move is likely to be led by uh, banking space. And for Bank Nifty specifically, uh, my next year target is around 47,000 to 49,000. What are your top bets uh, from the large cap, mid cap and the small cap universe for 23? Just you know, names and broad uh, return percentage expectation in the next one year. Yeah, so uh, I would still uh, stay away from small cap space. I would wait for some more clarity to emerge in terms of evolving situation. So small cap, I would still uh, uh, wait for some more confirmation. But yes, there are definitely certain opportunities from large cap and mid cap space one, uh, one should definitely capture. And uh, from the large cap space, uh, my preferred uh, pick will be Indigo. I think Indigo is preparing uh, for a multi-month rally. It has seen a significant consolidation and is set to move out of that consolidation. In fact, it is uh, trading uh, near a very crucial falling trend line. And uh, this consolidation near that trend line is a sign that it is preparing for this next multi-month rally. So Indigo will, will be my pick uh, where I'm expecting the stock to show uh, a good returns and it can very well uh, retest its highs seen at around 2380 uh, with the potential to head towards 2500. So Indigo will be one of the pick uh, followed by Bharti Airtel. Bharti Airtel is again a stock which is showing very interesting long-term structure and this correction which we are seeing in this month is providing this opportunity for investors to align with the larger uptrend and at around 800 it has a very good support so one can buy at current level also and going ahead uh, my targets for Bharti Airtel for the next year are uh, beyond 1000, uh, 1010 to be specific whereas uh, from mid cap space uh, my uh, preferred pick uh, will be uh, Federal Bank and followed by Bharat Coach. So Bharat Coach will be my second preferred pick from the mid-cap space. Any contrarian bets or dark horses uh, in terms of sectors? So uh, like we discussed, uh, most of the market participants are still apprehensive about the IT space. But I feel IT has already bottomed out and it has already uh, started the next leg on the upside. And this short-term correction is giving very good opportunity for traders as well as for investors to align themselves with the next up move which is on the cards. So my contract again bet will be IT space itself. I think in 2023 it is likely to be one of the outperformance in terms of outperformers in terms of sectors. 
so uh, within it uh, the it index itself is expected to give uh, around 20% kind of returns for 2023 so certain stocks like uh, persistent cocos hcl tech uh, will uh, deliver much higher returns in the range of 35 to 40% so from contrarian perspective i think it will be the space to watch out for Lastly, how should investors position themselves in the markets ahead of the budget in February? So I think uh, we are towards the fag end of this short-term correction. Uh, we are likely to see some base formation which can take place in the range of 17,800 to 18,200. So this 400 points kind of consolidation is expected over next few sessions. And this should be used as a staggered buying opportunity. Uh, once this base formation is done and once 18,200 gets taken out on the higher side, then I think uh, we will be... Uh, starting the next rally, which can uh, last for the next couple of months at least and can uh, surpass the all-time high seen at around 18888. So I think this consolidation of 17800, 18200 should be used as a staggered buying opportunity. Position sizing will be an important factor. Thanks, Gaurav. As a, as a disclaimer, would it be safe to assume that you may may not have the uh, an exposure to the stocks we discussed today? Yeah, sure. So I don't have personal exposure in these stocks, but we may have recommended these stocks to our clients. Thank you, Gaurav, for your time today. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Last week, we had news from China about the new coronavirus variant, BF.7, and how quickly it is spreading in the region. There are few cases reported in India of the new variant leading to a slight surge in the cases of COVID-19. While experts say there are no serious concerns for India, Tariq Ahmed decodes the new COVID-19 variant, BF.7. The new COVID subvariant, BF.7, has been spreading across China, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea and Hong Kong. Now, it has found its ground in India as well. BF.7 is an Omicron variant that has a higher transmissible rate than Delta and Beta variants among the vaccinated individuals. The good news is, Omicron variants are less lethal as they affect the upper respiratory tract. Delta variants of COVID affect the lower respiratory tract. BF.7, however, has a more transmissible tendency among the unvaccinated population. The symptoms of BF.7 infection are also not different from the symptoms of other COVID-19 variants. An infected person experiences a runny nose, sore throat, fever, cough, vomiting, fatigue, body ache, headache and diarrhea. China's zero-COVID policy has put the people there in a vulnerable position. Strict lockdowns and long isolation periods adopted by the Chinese government had successfully contained the spread of the virus. But in the process, a large population of the country never really got the chance to develop natural immunity. The vaccination has proved less effective against the spreading ability of the Omicron variants. Now, when zero COVID restrictions are being withdrawn amid large-scale protests, COVID variant BF.7 has started spreading in China. According to experts, India is in a better position to deal with the BF.7 variant. This is mainly due to the rigorous vaccination drives and a large population of the country that has developed some degree of immunity with their exposure to the virus. Also, compared with China, India had a relatively younger population. Omicron has proven lethal mostly among the senior population. According to the Union Health Ministry, there are 3,421 COVID cases as on 27 December 2022 in India. The numbers may not be alarming, but healthcare professionals insist on taking precautions. Keeping a vigil on travellers flying in from China and other countries battling Omicron BF.7, encouraging people to take booster shots of vaccine and wearing masks in public spaces can go a long way to keep ourselves safe amid the rise of fresh COVID infections. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. For more news and analysis, log on to business-standard.com. Thank you for watching.
If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.